All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Sean. Um, I have a biointensive farm here in Warren County. Um, been doing it for three years, which I think he said that during the introduction. But yeah, the uh, pretty much the talk today is going to be on agriculture, particularly it's going to be more on the small scale end. But you know, we're talking about bridges, so there will be some talk about large scale or um, agriculture as well. So. So yeah, I was going to start with the question, how important is agriculture? And as you can tell from this depiction, you know, it's very important. We wouldn't be here, wouldn't have civilization without agriculture for sure, but certainly wouldn't have your arts, your humanities, your sciences, probably not written language, currency, all that without agriculture. So the next question I'm going to present is what happens if all that, if the underpinnings of agriculture are, you know, compromised? And uh, there is a, an, a good example of that. And it is the island of Cuba. After the Cuban Missile, missile Crisis, they uh, had embargoes put on them. And in, into the 90s, the, uh, once the Soviet bloc collapsed, that really put a huge damper on uh, Cuba, just all around economically, but definitely agriculturally. And uh, from the agricultural aspect, you know, there was no fuel, no chemical fertilizers, uh, no chemical pesticides, um, anything like new tractors, parts for new tractors, all that stuff was very hard to acquire. And uh, and this, they were getting a lot of their food imported from the Soviet bloc. Up to 80% of their food was coming from the Soviet bloc. So, um, so what did they do about it? So, Organoponicos. You can look it up on the internet. It's very interesting. But pretty much what they did is they moved to organic farming. Very large scale organic farming in an urban setting. And... Uh, and I'll be going over some of those techniques a little bit later as to what they actually did, because I actually do a lot of that on my farm as well. But uh, So yeah, they have over 7,000 of them now, and it's the largest program, uh, you know, sustainable urban agricultural program in the world, from what I understand. Um, and this is pretty remarkable as well. 8% of their land is providing 90% of their fruits and vegetables in Havana. So... That's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and this is another thing, which is because it's subsidized, but um, their organic produce is actually cheaper than the conventional produce. And a lot of that comes from the subsidization as well, but they also grow it, and it's right there. Like, there's no packaging, no transport. I mean, it's just all right there. You come and get it. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to load it segue into kind of how I do my growing. I follow this kind of loosely, and a lot of these same concepts are used in Cuba as well, but uh, the, the type of agriculture that I use is called biointensive growing, and uh, it's pioneered by a guy named John Jevons in California. He's got a, uh, he's got a huge farm out in California, and uh, What's so nice or what's so awesome about this way of producing is you can get a lot of production in a small amount of area. So you can get two to four times more production per, per unit of area. So, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. And the next one, you know, 70, you can get up to, he claims he gets up to 66 to 90% less water consumption per pound. And you can replenish the soil very quickly because you're using techniques of composting pretty much everything that you grow. And you also grow crops for the sake of only composting. So not necessarily all or, um, economically beneficial crops. So, and the interplanting, which I'll go over a little bit later, um, what that is is pretty much you're planting other crops with other crops. And certain ones have certain benefits to one another. So, and uh, he uses a closed system approach. 
I try to use that as much as I can, but I, I bring in external inputs such as compost and manure, um, and he uses open pollinated varieties so he can do seed collection, which I don't do the seed collection, but so yeah. These are a couple of farms that are on the internet that are pretty prom prominent that use these techniques. Um, I would recommend checking some of these guys out. I mean, they have some pretty cool stuff up there. So yeah, here's one picture of the farm. What's so unique about this type of growing is that there's a lot of uh, innovation and a lot of what I call hacky, a lot of different techniques used in uh, small scale growing um, now currently. I do use this. I use the bed system as opposed to rows. And if you can look from the depiction, um, to the far left, that is a bed that's got five rows of carrots in it. Compared to your conventional row planting, you're, you're really planting a lot of stuff in a smaller area. So about two and a half to three times less area is needed to grow if you're using these beds. And the other cool thing is the hexagonal planting pattern is something that is used to pack in even more plants into a small area. And as you can tell, there's a few pictures of how the hexagon is used in nature. And I don't know why there's a nut up there because that's not in nature, but. <laughs> but yeah, you can, um, so yeah, here's, here's an example of it, depiction right here. So if you're just doing the straight line planting, if you have seven rows, 10 plants per row, you're gonna get 70 plants. And if you look at this uh, stagger planting or this hexagonal planting pa uh, pattern, you're getting up to, I think it's 22% more plants in an area. And there's added benefits to that as well. When you plant your plants closer together, you get sort of a canopy that forms. You get kind of a microclimate that forms up under your plants. This helps to suppress weed growth and it helps to also uh, retain your water. So that's how you can use 66% less water doing these growing techniques. And so yeah, here's companion planting. Pretty much uh, this is an example. This is one that I used uh, very early on. I don't do this type of uh, intricate planting anymore. If you look in the middle, I've got tomatoes planted and all on the outside, I've got nasturtiums and uh, basil and marigolds planted. And what all of these plants do is they have added benefits of um, keeping nematodes away, attracting pollinators, keeping other pests away. And this is a technique that I use, it's called weed occultation. And what this does is pretty simple. You put a tarp on the ground. <laughs> and here's what's so awesome about it. So if you water it before you put the tarp on the ground, and what the tarp does is it stimulates uh, the germination of weed seeds and once they emerge, there's no light for them, so they die. And what you're trying to do with this method is to create sort of a stale seed bed so you can plant your crops in it and worry about, you, you don't have to worry about weeds as much. So this is another, another uh, technique too. Once you pull up the tarp, you can come through with what they call a flame weeder. And what the flame weeder does is it just, you're literally burning the weeds. So, um, and you're also burning some of the seeds that are very, at the very top, maybe eighth of an inch of soil. Um, so this is the big, like if I were to say, what is the tool that has revolutionized small scale growing the most? And I would say it's the broad fork. The reason why is pretty much in conventional agriculture, you, uh, we have been working the land so long that you get this formation of a, of a hard pan. And what the broad fork does is the broad fork actually breaks through this hard pan. And if you can see through this example right here, the hard pan is on the left. Looks like it's at about, I don't know, six centimeters. That's a really bad hard pan. And the one to the right, the hard pan's been broken. So you're getting a whole lot more root growth. And here is me. Uh, <laughs> this is not easy work, working the broad fork. But this is me working the broad fork and uh, breaking the hard pan, getting ready for, uh, you know, getting ready for the next rotation. So 
This is another picture. Yeah, it's pretty, it's a beast, no lie. It's pretty heavy. I got that fabricated here by a welder. So, And precision cedars. So these, uh, I've got two of them here. The one on the right is an earthway. The one on the left is, uh, is a jang cedar. And these cedars are used to uh, pretty much evenly space your seeds. Um, you don't have to go and you know, individually put them in the ground. Um, they make things a whole lot more efficient, for sure. And BCS tractor, which is, I don't have one of these, but I definitely want one. <laughs> they are two-wheel tractors that work essentially like a four-wheel tractor. Um, you c they have a PTO on the back, so you can hook up tillers, harrows, even snow blowers, I mean, um, log splitters, all sorts of stuff. And I don't know, th I thought this was kind of interesting. I don't have one of these. But uh, this is one of those hacks that I was talking about. <laughs> so there is a, th what the, a lot of these small, small scale growers have been doing has been doing these conversions from washing machines to a salad spinner. Pretty much you just set it up to where it's on spin cycle. Um, and you, s you know, they put the food safe baskets in there. And from what I understand, this particular one you can buy is actually GAP certified. So you can use this on a farm if you have your GAP certification and, and it's compliant. So, um, and a greens harvester. What's so interesting about this thing really it is that you can get a lot of cutting done in a very short amount of time. Um, is it cutting greens? That takes a long time. So I don't have one of these. I really, really want one of these things. <laughs> but um, essentially, you just hook up like a, a drill to it, and it it uh, has a little. Uh, it's almost like those things that dry your car in the automatic car washers, and it slings them up there. And there's a blade on the front. It's two blades that cut it, and it puts catches it all in a bag. So and. Uh, this, I, I felt like I had to put this in here, talking about the CoolBot. The way a CoolBot works is you can have refrigeration very, very cheap by not having to buy a commercial compressor for your refrigeration. You can just use a regular air conditioner from Lowe's, wherever you want to go, and you hook up one of these CoolBot units to it, and essentially what it does is it takes over the uh, temperature functioning of the of the air conditioning unit. So you can cool it down to whatever temperature you want. So the Raspberry Pi, I actually brought this in today to take so y'all can see how small this thing is. But what's so interesting really about this thing is that uh, up at the very top you have, uh, you can barely see it, it's called GPIO header. That's the, the um, part of the unit that actually can interact with the world. So you can receive inputs and outputs from it. So you can automate a greenhouse with it. You know, you can automate your sprinkler systems with it. These chips cost about $20, and they're literally about the size of a beeper. So they can do a lot of things. You can actually run Linux on it, and you can do a multitude of other things, but um, there are a few examples I've seen on the internet of greenhouses that have been fully automated using a uh, Raspberry Pi unit. And I feel like I couldn't do this talk without at least mentioning this. This isn't really a, a feasible way of doing your large scale growing. But uh, if you have Facebook, you've probably seen the FarmBot. It is a fully automated gardening system. It plants the seeds, waters the seeds, pulls the weeds. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing and uh, very expensive, but they but the, the nice thing about this is that it is open source. You can go on the internet and it's extensible. So you can make it as long or as big as you want to, which leads us into large scale growing, some of the techniques that they're using there. Um, so cover cropping, that's become very popular. This helps to reduce erosion and also to put nitrogen back in the soil. And this is a crimson clover. It's a nitrogen fixating cover crop. So has a unique uh, ability to put nitrogen in the soil while you're growing. And uh, the no-till method, method is being used more and more, I'd say more so in the Midwest, but 
pretty much the way no-till works is you don't tear up the so tear up the soil. You you grow and you, like let's say you're doing a cover crop right here with this roller crimper. The roller crimper goes through the little chevron pattern uh, crimper crimper right there will crimp it all off right there at the ground level and you can come right through and you can just plant the next thing and that you're using the cover crop as a mulch to prevent weeds. Um, and then the flail mower, it's the way the flail mower works is it just pretty much takes all of the plant material and just just cuts the crap out of it and just turns it into just I mean it's literally uh, like if you can look at the picture you can tell that it's cutting some pretty tall grass all the way down. Now uh, GM plants they seem to be kind of the big bad wolf these days but um, this is a picture of a genetically modified tobacco plant that has a, a bioluminescence gene put into it. This is one of the first GM plants that I can remember um, learning about when I was in school. One of the things that uh, need to be done, I think, with the GM planting is uh, the refuge cropping. You don't see this as much. Pretty much what you do is you put regular, um, regular crop in and the other part being your GM plants and it allows insects to go into the refuge crop and survive while the ones uh, that are being affected by BT don't. So when they reproduce, you're going to still get less resistant uh, moths or in this example. So golden rice, this is probably the big one, I would say, uh, um, in terms of something that's really unique about uh, GM plants. So golden rice uh, could be what, I, what I'm considered the iodized salt of the 21st century. So what it does is that they have, uh, it's genetically modified to produce vitamin A. And in these certain countries right here, as you can tell, they don't have, they have clinical problems with vitamin A. So this causes vision problems. Here are some of the problems that agriculture is facing. You know, 80% of consumptive water is used in agriculture. 25% of global emissions is produced in agriculture. You have superbugs and many other things as well. And uh, possible problems that could be solved. So some of these techniques that I went over, you could solve the water consumption, agricultural runoff, weed and pest problems without the use of so much of these chemicals that we use now, without tearing the land up as much as we do. So. And this is my favorite picture from the farm, <laughs> me with uh, my sunflowers. So thank you guys so much for listening.